Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, the rule of law in the new abnormal, which gets more and more abnormal all the time, whatever that may be. And we are fortunate to have with us today, Professor Renelia Randall, Professor Emerita from the University of Dayton School of Law, and the creator and mastermind of the largest collection of information and articles on racism, racism in the law, and related topics at racism.org. We have Lorraine Della Porta from Providence, Rhode Island, a leading, very experienced mediator, head of her own mediation organization, and a professor at both the Roger Williams University School of Law and Quinnipiac School of Law, I think, and David Larson, professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, media past chair of the ABA section of dispute resolution and the creator of and, and leader of New York's online dispute resolution program that hugely expanded access to justice for many, many people in New York. So, well, folks, <laughs> we have a former president back in the news and back in court this week. <laughs> What do you think this means for the 2024 elections? Anything? I mean, uh, the issue really becomes when these three cases and the potential fourth one, when they're decided, I clearly then they're not going to be decided before primary. And I think that. Uh, I don't actually, I don't think any of them will be decided before the primary. And the question is whether they'll decide it before the election, um, the actual election. But I think, I think many of uh, the MAGA people are cults. And I mean, like any cult, the leader can do no wrong, even when they're doing after absolute wrong uh, in the eyes of the cult. There's an explanation, there's a reason. And for them, I don't think it's going to impact, I don't think any of this will impact how the MAGA people vote. I don't think it'll turn them away from them at all. And listening to some Trump supporters who are saying that people brought up questions about the new indictments, this is effective. And they said, no. Um, if President Trump is on the ballot, I'm going to vote for him. Um, and it's because of the economy. It's like, well, wait a minute. Do you have you paid any attention <laughs> to what's happening to the stock market, how well it's doing? Are you aware that unemployment's at a 54-year low? Do you have any idea what's actually happening with the economy? And, and sadly, they don't. And, you know, a lot that has to do with the way that, you know, the way we get our news now and how it's very targeted and streamed, and there are significant numbers of people that only listen to a particular voice and a particular perspective. They don't hear anything else, and they believe what they're hearing is perfectly true. And you know, I hold and I hold the general media a little responsible too, because every single day, literally every single day, there's substantial coverage on national news about Trump's reaction to the indictments and. He's saying things that are untrue. His counsel are saying things that are untrue. Um, and there's no pushback. They just kind of air it and they let you listen to it. And there's people who hear it and think that, oh, you know, I hear it every single day. Must be true. And, you know, that's always been one of Trump's strategies is that if you say a lie enough times, people will believe it. I mean, he's he's stated that he believes that. And that's kind of been his a modus operandi, the way he's approached things. So you would think that the serious indictments that go to the heart of our democracy, I and mean, that's the challenge now, that you, you, President Trump, try to destroy democracy and, you know, destroy what America is. You would think that that would have a major influence on voters' uh, positions, but so far it isn't, at least on the Republican side. If anything, um, these indictments have really fueled um, a lot of the fire for, for Trump. And, you know, they've really set him up to be kind of a martyr 
and he's raising money like crazy. And he's, you know, as we were talking before, he's burning through lots of money and in, in legal fees. Um, but I think people see, you know, he's really got people convinced that the justice system has been weaponized against him. Um, and I think he's using that very much to his advantage to raise money and to set himself up uh in that way and it's you know it's it's unfortunate but i think like you said david if you say something enough times uh we know through some brain science that it becomes kind of a people have a difficulty kind of discerning you know fact from from opinion or from something they've just heard over and over again it's almost like a brainwashing that happens and i think that's what we're seeing we don't have we use terminology a lot that we don't really have a common definition for and part of what we do, all of us, like the, the democracy, we all assume that everybody A knows what that is and the B agrees with it. Uh, and, and you can't appeal to people's desire to uh, save democracy, which is what I think the Democrats uh, want to do is they want to say, we've got to save democracy. And people are saying, huh, really? Now you want to save it? Uh, <laughs> you know, what about all those years when democracy was working against me and, and my people and my group, and you didn't have a problem with democracy? Uh, in any way, what does that mean? And I think part of that, that goes to part of the problem why so many, I think there's all these people who are going to believe Trump. And I think there's all these people who are, they're not Trump people, but they're skeptical of the Democrats as an alternative. And, and, and so Trump's, little, Trump's problems uh, can't be used against as a way to build support in the election. Talking about the election, the problem's going to become is going to be the same problem. Is that uh, if the Democrats doesn't don't have a platform that is going to really appeal to uh, a large percentage of the people in those in key states and i don't think there's anything they can do to uh to do that well i think i think one thing that democrats do have to do is kind of take the focus off the caricature that the republicans are making of biden and again emphasize what's happening in the economy because there's a lot of republicans who claim that the thing they really care about is the economy and yet they aren't paying attention to what's happening in the economy, um, that that a number of things have improved fairly significantly and, and really historically. And I think they've got to, to emphasize this and be careful about Bidenomics, Bidenomics economics, you know, or coming up with some kind of catchphrase and, and really be as factual as possible. Um, and one thing, another thing that the, the Republicans are doing, and they're, they're doing it, it's kind of a tried and true te technique or approaches is, is kind of a, a boutism. Um, you know, as soon as you start talking about the indictments, the immediate response is, what about Hunter Biden? You know, uh, Hunter Biden, you know, it's all about Hunter Biden. And, you know, there's a, they, they've worked very hard to create this false equivalence between anything that Hunter Biden has done, who was never a government official, and if did anything, you know, there were, there were tax, income tax offenses, and the gun charge, um, you know, it's going to plead to two misdemeanors and a gun charge that was going to go into a diversion program. You know, they're, they're, they're clearly offenses if they're true, but they don't equate to what's happening, um, you know, with, with, with Trump. But that's kind of been one of their immediate responses. As soon as you try to talk about the indictments, it's what about Hunter Biden? You know, and what about the Biden crime family? And they, they kind of go on this long rant um, in regardless of the fact that there's no hard evidence that that President Biden was ever connected or benefited from anything that Hunter Biden did. Um, and again, the fact is Hunter Biden was never part of the, uh, the administration. I heard that same statement and I immediately thought, 
of Jared and Ivanka, um, <laughs> you know, and, and Trump's own family. And so why aren't people kind of drawing that equivalency? Well, you know, Biden, Hunter Biden is Joe's son. Um, what about the Trump kids? And, uh, you know, from what I understand, the Trump kids aren't exactly in the clear right now either. So, um, and again, they weren't public officials, but they held positions within, you know, his, his off the president's office. And so, I, you know, it, that, that really makes me curious as to why people don't draw that equivalency. Yeah, the hypocrisy is really, you know, the whole thing about weaponization too. I mean, you know, I mean, Trump tried to weaponize the attorney general, you know, put all kinds of pressure on Barr, who, who was not as resistant as he should have been to, to do certain things. So, so, you know, he clearly tried to weaponize government when he was president. And now he's acting like this has never been done before. And, you know, I'm a huge victim here, um, in spite of evidence that I, that I think Biden has worked very hard, to, as has Merrick Garland, to kind of divorce themselves from these prosecutions. Um, you know, Biden is not talking about any of the indictments. Um, uh, Garland appointed a special prosecutor to, to distance himself. So we have levels of distance going here to say that Biden is doing this. It's just not factual. Well, I mean, the thing is, the, the, they don't, the people don't need to be factual to get people to believe. I mean, uh, belief is not about facts. Uh, it's not about provable, provable effects. It's about emotional connection. And, you know, the problem about appealing to the economy is that for many people, when you appeal to the economy, they're talking about what they pay for eggs. They're talking about what they pay for gas. They're talking about what they pay to go to Popeye's food. And if that has to change, if that's still high, Wall Street is of little relevance. Uh, I mean, it's of little relevance to me. I don't care that Wall Street is improving. Uh, and so when you appeal to the economy based on what's happening on Wall Street and what's happening, uh, even unemployment, because in my community, my unemployment rate is still twice the right weight. And so, you know, the, un the whole issue is uh, personal. Uh, and, and we want people to make it non-personal and factual. Uh, when uh, for many people, that's just not going to end life. I'm placing this at the Democrats' door. You know, you should know this. If you don't know this, you should know this. And so when you keep uh, making your camp, when you keep countering about uh, these things that are factually true, but don't go down to the individual person when you talk about the economy, when you are neighborhoods, uh, you, you're not really appeal. They're, they're not going to really accept that. They're going to reject that. So I, I kind of think that, uh, yeah, people are not going to talk about, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, Vonka because they're not in the eye anymore. I mean, it's like the short term memory. What do we talk about? We talk about what's right in front of us. Uh, and unless you can find a way to put them in the eye, they're never going to be a comparison for most most people because most people will have forgotten what they did. So it's really such a short term memory <laughs> issue in this country, right? It's like what's the twenty four hour news cycle, and then it's we're off and running to something else. It's a good point. You know, inflation is is remaining to be a problem. And I think Professor Randall's right, is that inflation is something that touches people on a daily basis, um, but it has improved significantly. One of the high impact items in any inflationary period is in our automobile driven society is gas. Um, you know, I just saw that Saudi Arabia announced today it's going to continue its production cutback 
you know, and given what's happening in Ukraine, we've lost the Russian source of oil. So there's things happening internationally over which the Democrats have no control. You know, and so that's that's a challenge. Um, and that's kind of keeping inflation up. Uh, but it ha but it has improved. Um, the, other, the other thing kind of I wanted to mention is that as you know, as I watch national news, and I continue to get frustrated at the coverage, and I'm listening to this. So there's all this aboutism. What about Hunter Biden? That's kind of one defense. And the other defense is uh, the new one that we're hearing now is that uh, this is all about the First Amendment. You know, yeah. The president, the president, you know, is just you know anything he did is protected by the anything he did is protected by the First Amendment. And all you have to do is kind of think this through a little bit. So let's say that there's a a requirement to do an environmental assessment report, you know, and say you're manufacturing something that's and it's involving mercury, and maybe you're releasing mercury in the environment, and you need to at least report how much that is happening. Well, so you decide I'm not going to report it, and then um, and the you know, children are injured, people in the community injured, and you come back and say, well, that was my First Amendment right. It was my First Amendment right to say whatever I want about my mercury pollution. You know, it's like. So you file your income tax and you put in hundred thousand dollars of deductions that didn't exist. And you can say, well, that's my that's my freedom of speech. I was just speaking about the deductions that I have. You know, there's this idea that's being promoted that that somehow there's no that there's a kind of a First Amendment right to commit a crime. That it's one thing to maybe talk about committing the crime, and it's a few things that are problematic. You talk about committing the crime against the president. Well, even if you don't do it, that could be a problem. But there's most things you could talk about doing that are going to be okay. But when you take action to actually implement what you're talking about, that's when it really becomes problematic. When you when you file the false environmental assessment report, when you file the false income tax report, um, that's different. That's not the First Amendment. That's not a First Amendment issue. Um, and then the, the other thing that's being bandied about is that uh, Trump can't be prosecuted because attorneys told him that what he was doing was okay. That somehow, that if an attorney tells you something and you do it, no matter what it is, you are absolutely immune. So I guess presumably if an attorney told you that if you had a, a, a fence to speak with your neighbor and that it's okay to settle it by taking your handgun and shooting that person, that, oh, I guess you're okay, because the, the attorney said you could do it. That's, again, like, like a, a ludicrous idea. Um, so we've got these ideas that this is a First Amendment issue, that he's immune because an attorney told him, um, you know, and he's doing this to play to the kind of court of public opinion, hoping to get a juror on there that's not going to listen to the case, you know, that's going to be persuaded by all these kind of mistruths and it's not gonna, you know, it's gonna not vote for conviction. And that's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to, you know, basically poison enough people that statistically they'll get somebody on that jury that's not gonna that's not gonna convict. What extent do we uh, law professors have contributed to this problem by training lawyers to think that it's their job to come up with a defense, uh, any defense, as long as, uh, well, we know that's not true under ethics, but I keep wondering, are lawyers an ethical violation when they go out and promote a view of the law that does not exist? and don't make it clear that they are, in fact, being, arguing for the law to be changed. I mean, I think there's a difference between get, going public and saying the law is this, this is a free, free speech right, and that I think it ought to be a free speech right. And what I'm arguing for, the law doesn't make it a free speech right right now, but I'm arguing for the law to be changed. I, I, I don't have a problem with arguing for the law to be changed. I mean, to even to include action. I don't think that it should include actions, 
But I think that that's, a, that's an argument that can be made and it would be up to the courts to say yay or nay to it. But I think the problem I have is the lawyers are not clearly articulating the difference between what the law is and what they would like it to be. And is that an ethical violation? And have we been poor law professors for not making sure that our students understand that difference? Yeah, there's a description of the January 6th that goes right to what you're saying. And one person described it as a coup looking for a legal theory. Um, you know, that's what that's what the attorneys were doing. That um, you know, instead of instead of kind of just being honest about what happened here, that they're trying to be as creative as possible to somehow justify what on its face is illegal action. And I think that, at least in my understanding, kind of goes to what Professor Randall is saying that you know to think that that's okay um, is problematic. I mean, I think we we teach our students, you know, about zealous advocacy, and I and I hope, you know, we're we're doing enough to help them distinguish between uh, zealous advocacy and crossing over a line um, where they're, you know, having, you know, telling clients to do things that are, you know, against the law, and if they're uh, interested in, you know, changing the law, I think making that distinction that this is the law as it as it stands now, and here's um, maybe ideally or aspirationally where it should be and, and helping the students to understand those differences. I think we absolutely have a responsibility to do that. Well, and if you're going to rely on the <clears throat> advice of counsel defense, <clears throat> it doesn't help a lot when your vice president refers to those people you rely on as crackpots. <laughs> and when those that are in the public light already, Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, John Eastman, have been not only thoroughly discredited, but their licenses to practice are up with recommendations against them in several of those cases. So I don't think the advice of counsel, has the advice of counsel ever been a defense? Uh, I know that if, the, if you get a, an opinion from an attorney general, that's in writing, that you can use that opinion to kind of sway the court uh, your way. But can you really go into court and say, my lawyer told me to do it, so uh, I'm innocent of whatever it is I'm being charged with? Yeah, I think, that, I think the theory is that, you know, that I'm being charged criminally. And for these criminal offenses, it's gotta be a mens rea. You know, there's got to be an intent in ah. um, and because they told me it wasn't a problem i didn't have the requisite intent the problem in this case is many many people uh, of his own advisors said no you cannot do that you know yeah. there's a lot of evidence now and you know that's what makes this these indictments so interesting is that and a lot of the evidence is coming from republicans people in the inner circle so to the degree he's going to say that I never had the requisite intent because I was advised in this manner. It's just not true. So that's why you're going to get these people testifying. It's going to be interesting, you know, as Mark Meadows is going to come forward. Uh, you know, he's been very much under the radar. and People are speculating that he's going to testify and talk about what Trump actually knew and what he was told and what he what he actually acquiesced to and said, understood. And, you know, as soon as we get that kind of testimony, now this idea that, well, because I did it because a attorney, because a Sidney Powell said it's okay, kind of goes away when a lot of other people are saying, don't do it. That's right. And, and when you that. actually uh, have in previous, uh, given an understanding that you know that what you're doing is illegal. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they, they've got Mike Pence, you know, testifying and saying that, uh, Donald Trump, when when he wouldn't acquiesce to Donald Trump's request, he said, "Oh, Mike, you're too honest, right? Yeah. Because he wouldn't he wouldn't cert, you know, decertify." So, I mean, you have that, um, and I'm sure many more will come out. I mean, he did a lot of Trump did a lot of answer shopping with attorneys, and there's a lot of evidence of that, where he went attorney to attorney until he got the answer that he wanted, um, and a lot of people are on record as telling him no. 
you know, that's false. So I yeah. just into our last few minutes. If it's going to come down to whether this case has enough of an impact on enough independent voters in swing states to make a difference, is there anything in this case that you see that might contribute to making that kind of difference? I don't know. It depends on whether the swing voters, I mean, it depends on whether the swing voters are, are how much they want to believe in the, and I'm using democracy in quotation marks, uh, and how much uh, what he did was undermining uh, that democracy. There's obviously the conspiracy against rights, uh, the based on the uh, civil rights uh, statute, uh, that could have a huge difference because uh, it could bar him from holding office. It, I think if he was found guilty of uh, the conspiracy of rights. In fact, that statue, I think, has a death penalty attached to it on some of the things. So I think that uh, it could swing voters. I mean, first of all, it could swing the election because he may not, if he was found guilty, he may be enjoined from holding office because of being found guilty under the statute. And I think that, uh, you know, it just depends on running against who's running against him. I so hate DeSantis that it, it would be hard put for me to, uh, uh, you know, vote. Uh, I mean, let me. Excuse me, I'm yeah. the Biden thing. I think part of the problem is Biden is aging and we don't want it. So is Trump, but uh, Biden is more visibly aging. And I think that that's got to have an impact when you go, you know, the devil's choice. Do I want to be killed with a bullet to my head? Or do I want to be killed with a knife to my heart? You know what? I don't know that swing voters will say, you know what? I'm just going to stay home. I, you know, I, 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 I hear uh, that you're right. I, I hear a lot of kind of apathetic response when I talk to particularly younger people. They, they've just kind of had it and they're just, my fear is they're not going to show up. So is it going to come down to the least worst alternative? Is, is that what really happened in 2020? That's what always happened. For those of us who don't believe in the Democrats or the Republicans, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, I think that it's going, it's going to come down to the least worst alternative and it depends on how you see that. And if you think those uh, prosecutions have been politically motivated, it, even in part, you might be willing to ignore them uh, uh, a, a, a guilty. That's why that, that about is so dangerous to say that, oh, the only reason he's being prosecuted is revenge for the fact that we've called out Hunter Biden. And that's why that 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 line of argument is so so damaging. And one thing that's been perplexing all along is that you're running against somebody and yet you're refusing to, to challenge that person based on the facts. I mean, to watch the Democrat the Republicans in the primary field, you know, kind of continue to support Trump is just unbelievable. Um, you know, and a handful of a couple of them, Christie, for example, you know, has been calling him out, um, uh, but most of them are not. And uh, and that's just befuddling because that's the person you're trying to beat. And now the person that's been set up for you with these indictments, why are you not fleshing those out and explaining why that disqualifies this person from being president, but they, for the most part, are not doing it? I think a couple of them are starting to maybe turn the corner a little bit. I heard Nikki Haley 
kind of say, you know, if you vote for Donald Trump, we're going to be talking about lawsuits um, for the next four years. If you vote for me, we'll be talking about issues. So I think there's there, there's little pieces that you see of people starting to to distance themselves. But I also, you know, think that some of them are like, well, if he wins, maybe I'll be vice president, maybe yeah. with the exception of Mike Pence. Right. Or thinking, I part of the problems is is Donald Trump is so foul and retaliatory. And if you feel powerless, the least thing you want to do is get on his bad side if he wins. Because you're looking at four years of harassment and maybe in career being destroyed. And I think people, Republicans are probably thinking that, you know, Republicans in the field thinking, I don't have a chance to win, but he does. And if I come out against him, I'm basically setting myself up uh, mm -hmm. to be the whipping, his whipping person. Yeah, you know, and, and the, the criticism is that the current administration is weaponizing government, but you know that he, that Trump is, you know, well prepared to weaponize government. Yeah, I mean that that's that's what he does, and uh, so so yeah, I agree with Professor Randall. That's probably that element of intimidation. Yeah. So I wanted to thank all of you for your thank thoughts. you. Yeah. We're still left with the question: Will this case make a difference? And will it make enough of a difference in 2024, whatever the choice may be? Professor Randall, Lorraine, David, thank you so much for joining us. Those of you who view this now and in the future, thanks so much. Come back. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks. Think Tech Hawaii, thanks for supporting us. Aloha. <laughs>